you know, most people, I would guess, well, I should ask you, like, how would you think most people would explain um, the differences in net worth among these groups? People worked hard for it. And so right. They, they saved their money and they put it in the bank and they weren't <laughs> buying fancy tennis shoes and, you know. But if we look at the sort of historic context of this country, we'll find that the parents and grandparents of white Americans had higher incomes and earned salaries. They had accumulated retirement through union membership, um, participation in Social Security. They benefited from home ownership policies and so on. That at a time of great wealth accumulation and opportunity, people who were deemed to be white were able to acquire property. Others were not. And so uh, there were a number of um, people, Asians in particular, who would go to petition the courts to say, well, you know, I should be considered white. And if they had property, the courts, um, there's a famous case saying that they, um, you know, they're not considered white and their property was taken away from them. When um, uh, Social Security was created, agricultural and domestic work were excluded, which were two of the main occupations where you saw a number of African Americans able to find employment. When there was a VA um, uh, uh, act and, and opportunities were provided for education and home ownership, um, African Americans, again, were not able to take advantage of these opportunities. So there were reasons, and we can see here in the other chart that sort of lays out, so that the codification of race by our legal system, by our public policies, by our institutional practices benefited whites and disadvantaged people of color, which helps explain some of these huge disparities that we see, which is why when people say, why are we talking about this stuff in the past, is really not relevant now. It's very, very um, relevant both for practical reasons when we look at wealth disparities, but also for symbolic reasons. Um, and the, the, um, these disparities didn't arise just from the past, which were huge things, but also we have more recent causes of, um, of wealth disparities. And there was all this discussion about the uh, financial crisis that was triggered in part by subprime mortgage lending. And we just quickly walk through some of this that, you know, you can see that these subprime lines, uh, excuse me, subprime uh, loans were highly correlated with high foreclosure rates. Well, guess who was were the groups that were mainly getting these loans. It was blacks and Hispanics received these loans at a much higher rate than whites. Even when you control for credit, when you control for income, when you control for all of these other um, um, factors, they were much more likely to receive these higher rate home purchase and re refinance loans um, after controlling for all of these factors. And there are, again, lots of reasons, different ways to explain it, but the fact of the matter is that <clears throat> you know, home ownership has been one of the ways that people have been able to accumulate wealth, to have some sorts of security to provide for their families, to, you know, help send their kids to college and so on. Well, this report from the United uh, for a Fair Economy estimates that the total loss of wealth for people of color from subprime loans taken out between 2000 and 2008 will be huge, between 164 and 213 billion dollars. And again, um, we think all of these things are important for people to know and to understand because we have these quote unquote racially neutral policy decisions to deregulate the financial sector so that people can engage in these sort of high risk, um, high cost uh, lending activities at a huge scale. But it interacted with these initial, these existing inequities to strip people of color of their wealth. The other thing I want to talk about, the other part of our, the knowledge and ideological context is our national values. And Susan spent a lot of time this morning talking about individualism and personal responsibility, which dominates just about every way in which we talk about um, these things in this country. And there's also meritocracy, where there's this belief that advancement depends on uh, talent and effort, sort of like with the guy in the video in the orchestra, and you have this celloist mm -hmm. who's this fabulous celloist, and it's his, you know, he's got this talent, so why isn't he there? Um, and also equal opportunity. Um, there's a huge value that we have in this country, and people believe that there's this, this, level, um, this level playing field. Um, but our national values provide a conceptual framework that we use to interpret just about everything we see um, around us. So that if you believe in meritocracy, that advancement depends solely on your talent and your effort. If you believe in uh, personal responsibility and individuality, so that individual choices 
and behavior are the primary determinants of outcome. And if you believe that there's this level playing field that everyone has an equal opportunity um, to get ahead, then it suggests that the problem is with the individual. It's not with society. It's not with our systems. Um, but it's with uh, individuals. And in fact, in the um, uh, chart that I showed you earlier of um, the general social service survey of people's responses about different things, there was a question about racial disparities are due to the lack of will among black people. And 50% of the people who responded to that stated that that, in fact, was a, a true um, statement. So um, <laughs> we think this piece on national values and, you know, objectively, these are not ne bad values to have, these national values, but when they remain unexamined, when we don't think about how they apply to different groups, when we don't look at them within a historical context, it really distorts um, the picture. It both rationalizes the disparities that we see, it justifies the disparities that we see, and it makes it so that we don't really need to talk about it because it explains away everything that um, we are seeing. The third part of the knowledge context that I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about is contemporary um, culture. And again, this piece um, reinforces our values, it reinforces white privilege and stereotypes about different groups. And while we talk about this as contemporary culture, um, a number of the sort of uh, stereotypes have their bases in history. We can sort of track back. There's a really great um, uh, documentary. It's kind of old now, but it's called Ethnic Notions. I don't know if people have seen it, but it really sort of tracks these stereotypes over time. And you can see that they're not just historic, but they're also some of the same ones that are contemporary. And they reinforce a lot of uh, beliefs um, and um, these sort of values that we hold um, dear. And there's a challenge with this, because when people are seen as possessing deficient or deviant um, cultural practices, then it would make sense then to deny resources to people. It would make sense for people to point to um, culture as an individual problem, not a structural impediment to progress. And again, these, as I mentioned, these stereotypes have been um, recycled. And so we can look then at data about these job interview things. I'm sure everybody has seen this where uh, researchers sent out resumes of fictitious job applicants using common white names and common black names. And you can see the differences in who got called back for um, interview requests. And there was a more recent study, which you probably have seen as well, which showed that when resumes of fictitious black and white job applicants um, who were identical, except for the fact that the white males had a criminal record and the black males did not have a criminal record, record the white males were more likely to get um, called back. So our <laughs> sense is that all of these things sort of feed into each other. We can see, again, um, this data on the uh, charges of misconduct by race in South Carolina that the Civil Rights Project did. Um, what I find so striking about these data is that when you look at things where there is discretion, you know, are the kids creating a disturbance? Does the teacher feel threatened by the kid? You see huge disparities in um, charges of misconduct where things are a little bit more objective. Do the kids have drugs on them? Are they carrying weapons, you see that the disparities seem to shrink a bit. So this issue of, um, of uh, discretion, the beliefs that we hold in our heads, our views about these different things, you can see how these things play out. Similarly with school discipline, as a reason of uh, comparing these data to um, total enrollment versus um, suspensions and expulsions, again, we see disproportionate uh, numbers of black uh, kids in particular getting expulsed or suspended from school. And um, just a quick point about representations in television and print news, and, and Susan talked about some of the reasons why um, crime is such a big part of the news, but what we found, what uh, some researchers have found is that, you know, 76, it's a huge number of people uh, say they get their opinions about crime uh, from the news. So you have this people, this source of information where African Americans are overreported as perpetrators of crime, presented as more threatening, and you have a lack of sort of balancing, um, balancing information that it's not surprising that we see some of the um, outcomes that we do in, when uh, studies that have been shown that 
perceptions of who's possessing um, uh, weapons. So for example, minorities are perceived as possessing weapons even when they don't have them um, and are more likely to be shot in experiments where people are asked to you know, sort of um, like pop up and look and see who's there um, and respond in kind. Where studies have shown that when people are shown a crime report with no identified perpetrator, that people falsely identified African American um, as a perpetrator, and that exposure to images of young black male criminal defendants um, increased whites' punitive attitudes toward crime and tendencies to endorse beliefs such as that blacks have, um, are um, less intellectually able. So it's, um, we can see how this knowledge context piece is really sort of critical to thinking about structures, to thinking about structural racism um, in particular. And what I want to do now is just turn a little bit to the way in which we believe these elements of our knowledge culture interact to help um, generate social manifestations of structural racism. We've talked already a little bit about institutional, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend much more time um, on that. But ultimately, our belief is that these things all lead to both a reproduction and production of um, racial inequities. So one of the processes I just want to mention is what we call progress and retrenchment, which is basically people say we've made a lot of progress. And in fact, we have uh, made progress. We've had some major victories. But what tends to happen is that we will make some gains. These gains will be challenged. They can be neutralized. They can be undermined. We don't get a sort of countervailing point, as Susan was saying early, and then we get backlashes. We've seen this with affirmative action. We've seen it with exclusionary zoning. Um, we've seen it in education. Similarly, we talk about um, a number of different social processes that maintain racial um, hierarchy. So we can look at things like marginalization, where this really describes the kind of inclusion but relegation of non-whites to low status low-paying positions in many different employment and opportunity sectors. So for example, Mexicans in the food service industry. And social isolation and exclusion, we can see particularly evident in for uh, blacks and metropolitan uh, residential patterns and isolation of Native Americans on reservations. Um, exploitation really focuses on the disadvantages faced by many immigrants uh, of color in, the, in sectors like agriculture, like migrant farm workers, or in manufacturing, like the garment industry or in the home care industry. And all of these things we could describe as some type of racial sorting. It's, it's spatial, it's institutional, but it also, we believe, happens in the minds of individuals. Um, and I think this is a good example of sort of the intersection between the structures, our beliefs, our knowledge system, and how it, um, uh, people internalize this. And I think, again, this is particularly important for people who are interested in uh, youth issues and youth development issues because we can, uh, people can um, internalize these kind of popular representations in ways that um, shape their expectations of themselves can, um, as well as of other um, uh, groups. And identity formation is, one, is widely accepted as one of the most critical developmental tasks of adolescence. Um, and achieving a well-integrated, and for all adolescents, um, achieving a well-integrated, solid racial identity is a key aspect of that developmental um, process. But all of the things that we've been talking about just now um, can undermine this process for young people, where you, have, you can have uh, people internalizing feelings of superiority or feelings of inferiority, depending on which side of the table on which um, they are sitting. So for example, uh, as Peggy McIntosh talks about, that as a white person, she's been taught that racism puts other people at a disadvantage, but um, doesn't really look at how it puts her at an advantage. So that a lot of these things are taken for granted. They're not questioned. And it makes sense that we see these outcomes that we see. On the other